Hello everybody, I'm Dick Wall. I was, up until a few months ago, a, uh, a confirmed Flash and Flex and Apollo skeptic, uh, mainly because I'm a Linux user and have been uh, felt left out in the cold by Flash and Flex for a number of years. <laughs> uh, and then I met James, and uh, he uh, encouraged me to take another look at it. And uh, I figured if he can do that for me, he can probably do that for just about anyone. So James Ward, he's a uh, evangelist for Adobe, for the Flex, Flash, and Apollo technologies. Um, this tech talk is going to be a, a publicly released one, so uh, please no confidential uh, questions. And, and with that, I'll hand over to James. Great. So take it away. <clears throat> Thanks, Dick. So uh, I am an evangelist for Flex. Uh, must confess that uh, I am not an evangelist like in the religious sense. I, I am, I'm speaking about Flex um, because I have been a Java developer since about 97. I started building some applets and then transitioned to servlets uh, and then you know, wrote the, the typical couple thousand line long servlet and then um, got into struts and JSPs and all that and found that I was having a really hard time creating applications, web applications that looked halfway decent. And so then, um, through a series of events, I found Flex and started doing some Flex development uh, and just fell in love right away with, with Flex because I was able to create much better looking applications with Flex um, than I was able to do with HTML and, and JavaScript and uh, those technologies. So I want to give you uh, an overview of what Flex is, what Apollo is, uh, what you can build with them, and then we'll, we'll actually write a little bit of code together so you can get a sense for the programming model behind Flex. So. Um, to get started, the, the first application that I want to show is one that we built as a proof of concept to show what we think uh, user experiences should be like in web applications. And this is, of course, built with Flex uh, running in the browser. So this is an application that an insurance company would have to, to help a user enter information about an, an accident that they got into. So I'll come in and enter my policy information, my username and password and then my driver information. You'll see that in this application, there's these nice transitions between these different pages in the, in the form. And I'd like to point out real quickly that uh, we didn't just add these in to, to be cute and to be flashy. We really did it for a very specific purpose. And this, is, um, this, this type of application is showing you what, users, uh, what great user experiences are like. And we feel that by adding those transitions into this application, we really help the user to stay in context of where they, where they were, where they are, how much further they have to go, so that the user can make this cognitive association with, uh, with movement to say, I was there, I'm here now, and I know how to get to the next step. So it's a, it's a very important part of this application is those transitions. It's not just there to, for us to be cute. Um, so I'm going to come in and select my, my vehicle now. And it's a Toyota Prius 2006, and it's gold. And here we see the, that, uh, that car, my car, that I selected. And now I can begin to specify the damage that happened on this vehicle. So I'll mouse over the different parts of this, and I can say uh, the hood was scratched, the front bumper was um, missing, and we can begin to detail all this information about what happened to our car when we got in this car accident. Maybe we could take it a step further and let the user even take out a pen and draw on the car to, to really illustrate the details of what happened to this car uh, in the accident. Uh, and another thing I like to point out in this application is that this, this uh, proof of concept was built not just to show how to build a better user experience, but also to show how uh, rich internet applications not only do that, but also provide value back to the business. We don't just do rich internet applications to be cute. We do it for a very specific business, uh, business purpose. Uh, and in this case, the, the business purpose is to uh, get, get more and better information from the user about what happened in this accident. So, um, so by, by allowing the user to, to just select the, the parts of the car and specify the damage, we're, uh, we're able to get better information from the user. So if you contrast this to a typical type of web form where it's a gigantic text field that says, uh, describe what happened, and the user will say, well, I was on my way to work, I stopped by Starbucks, got a large you know, cappuccino, and you know, who's, who knows what the user is going to enter in this text box? So by giving them a visual way to, to illustrate what, uh, what actually happened, this provides much better information back to the insurance company. So and then we take this to an, another level on the next form, where now we, now we tell the user, all right, recreate the accident. So now we allow the user to 
take the car and drag it around the screen to, to recreate the accident. So they can say, well, I was coming from the north, I um, crossed a few lanes of traffic, uh, and turned right, this bozo coming from the other direction, he turned left and boom, he hit me. And so, again, this is not just about you know, the, the flashiness of it, it's really about creating a better user experience for, uh, for the end user and about, creating, uh, uh, about having more business value uh, for the business that, that is behind this application. So, and feel free to stop me and ask questions as I, as I go through uh, this, but. So this is, uh, this is kind of my, my, uh, my, my best concept of what a rich internet application really should be. Uh, it should encompass both, both a, a great user experience, but also provide business value for, the, for that richness um, to, to the business behind it. So another example of some, some great stuff that we can do in rich internet applications is with Flex is to um, mash up Ajax and Flex applications to create some interesting things here. So uh, this particular application, oop, and that's because I don't have my webcam plugged in. So we'll get another one of those in a second. Um, but this is, uh, this is taking a Flex application, combining it with Google Maps. So now I can sign into this application and into this one. And now these two users can collaborate in real time. So as one user gra uh, takes the map and drags it around, we, um, we, we push that event in real time out to the other user's browser to change, the, change where uh, the map position is. So uh, that's using a real time push technology, using a binary socket. And so it's, it's not using a comet style polling method. We're actually doing a real binary socket. Uh, if, that binary socket isn't available due to firewall issues, we can actually fail over to a polling comet style communication. So um, then this one's kind of cool. We can also kind of show off the, the vector graphics capabilities of, of Flex and Flash here. So I can now take, uh, uh, take the map and start drawing on it. One, user can, one of the users can say, I think we should go this way. And the other user can you know, go select a different color here and say, no, we should definitely go this way. And you know, they can argue about the right, right, right way to wind their way through New York. So uh, again, this is about creating a better user experience in this particular application, but also specifically through uh, using real-time communication to, and uh, real-time messaging. So that's uh, another thing that we're seeing with rich internet applications is utilizing that real-time messaging to do interesting things like this. Another uh, fun thing that we can do with Flex is we can uh, get really flashy. But these aren't built with a typical timeline-based tool. They're built with uh, what we call the open source, or what will be open source, uh, Flex SDK. Uh, and it's, it's free, um, will be open source by the end of the year. And so you can build really interesting applications by writing some code, which you'll see in a little bit. But in this particular one, uh, the engineer that built this, he, he, uh, he remembered when he was a kid having this anatomy book that had these transparent pages that you could flip through and it would have different kind of layers of the body in it. So he thought that would make a great, uh, great flex demo. So he scanned in those pages and created this book component. So now you can take the book and open it up You'll see that that page was, the cover was hard. That's just a parameter on this component. But now we get you know, the, the transparent page, and we can drag the page back and forth and, um, and flip the next one over, too. So, uh, so again, this is all just built with, it, with this reusable component. Um, and, and because it's reusable, we can do lots of other interesting things. He has a number of uh, other, th other uh, Scenarios. I'll show a couple of them. This is all available on his blog, quietlyscheming.com. Uh, it's one of our, our flex, uh, actually the architect for the, the free flex SDK. So um, this one is interesting because it shows how you can combine this, this, uh, this book component with flex components or with flex charts. So now you can get a chart that's animating as we slide the page over. Or even we could play video on a page. So you can really put any, any type of flex component into, this, uh, into the, the book component that you want. Um, switching gears a little bit, but still showing this component, I want to show how he then took this, the same exact 
component and used it within Apollo. So Apollo is our desktop runtime for web applications. So uh, with, with Apollo, we're able to take uh, HTML, Ajax, Flex, um, Flash, uh, JavaScript, HTML, CSS, all that, and combine it into a desktop application experience. So he took his, his book component and is rendering a web page. So this is the real live, uh, live Google here. We can search for the Java Posse. And this is real live Google, but it is in the book component. So now we can grab the page. And oops, we shouldn't be showing Yahoo here. We'll go back. Um, so, uh, so here we get, here we can go somewhere else here. We'll load Java Posse in this other page. So there we get the Java Posse site, uh, all, again, within, within this book component. So, uh, so again, all just reusing that, that same book component, uh, but this time pulling in HTML content. So, uh, so I don't know if you would ever realistically use this for anything useful, but it's kind of a fun way to show component reuse. Yeah? How are we rendering HTML? So Apollo, the Apollo runtime has both the Flash engine embedded in it, um, which is what we use for Flex. And it also has WebKit, the open source uh, HTML engine behind Safari. So we combine those two technologies. And actually, I don't know how technical um, you, you want me to get. But, uh, but what we do is we actually read how WebKit would, would output the HTML. We then take that and turn it all into Flash objects, and our ultimate end result is Flash objects uh, in, in um, Apollo applications. So in Apollo, everything, the ultimate output rendering is all Flash, but we use WebKit behind the scenes to have a real HTML engine. So um, a couple things to, to note before I, I move on too much further about, about how Flex and Flash and Apollo are, are work from a product perspective. Uh, of course, Flash is, is a freely available download uh, browser plugin. Um, Flex 2 applications require Flash 9, which currently, uh, in our latest statistics, after nine months of being out, is at about 83, 84% adoption worldwide. So uh, you guys are, are probably um, all are familiar with, with Flash being kind of the de facto standard for, for rich interactive content on the web. It's, it's the most distributed piece of software in the world. Uh, it has penetration. Um, if we look back to, I think, Flash 7, uh, the penetration numbers are at about 98% worldwide for Flash. So it's, it's the most distributed piece of software on the web on, on I think, 700, different PC, 700 million different PCs and, and mobile devices. So, um, so this is why uh, we have this great foundation to build these applications on. Um, and we even recently uh, have, have taken the, the core of Flash and, and now the core of Apollo and open sourced it with, uh, with Mozilla. So if, you've, if you're familiar with Mozilla Tamarin, that's the open source uh, virtual machine that, that we use within Flash Player and within uh, the Apollo runtime. So, uh, so Tamarin now is open source with Mozilla. Uh, all that it really does, it's kind of the whole guts of, of our, our Flash virtual machine and of Apollo. It takes uh, ECMAScript bytecode code or ECMAScript code and just executes that within a JIT compiler. So, um, so there's some, some great benefits about having uh, Tamarin and this JIT compiler available to us in our client applications. Um, one of those is performance, which is uh, another benefit here of Flash. This is a, an application that I wrote. You can find it on, on my blog, jamesward.org, uh, and you can play with it on your own. But I want to show you, I want to compare uh, the differences in data loading between Ajax and, uh, and Flex. So within Flex, of course, we're using that Tamarin virtual machine. Uh, and then within um, the Ajax uh, benchmarks, we'll be using just XML HTTP request. And uh, I'll do JSON for you um, today. But you can play with the other methods. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to my server. I'm going to have my server generate uh, 5,000 rows of JSON data. Uh, and that's just JavaScript object notation. Send that back across the wire. And then we're going to do an eval on that within, uh, within JavaScript. And then we're going to take that, that eval code, the, our objects, and we're going to create an HTML table from, uh, from those objects. So I'll run this. And we'll see how long that takes. So we measure four things, the server execution time, the transfer time the parse time, and the render time. So total amount of time here for that 5,000 rows is about two and a half seconds. Um, you can see the, the various breakdowns there. But the parse time, interestingly, just the amount of time to, to actually do that, uh, that um, the, the eval on that JSON string uh, took about 1.2 1, 1 seconds. 
and we can go see the actual output of this um, uh, of that that benchmark here. It's just an HTML table with all 5,000 rows in it. So you'll see all 5,000 rows. This one's just a plain old HTML table. It doesn't support client-side sorting. Uh, I did add a Dojo test because Dojo does support client-side sorting, um, but I, I won't do that test for you today. Um, but uh, but so the so the. The best method, there are various methods that you can use within Flex to talk to your back end to get data in. The best method is to use uh, what a protocol called AMF. Uh, AMF is a binary object serialization of our, uh, of our objects. So what happens is in AMF, we go to the server and say, hey, get me five, the same 5,000 rows, but encode it in this, this AMF format which is pretty much the flash memory format, then we send that across the wire, and then when we get it back on the flash side, we, we kind of just stuff it into a place in memory, and so that then we have all the objects available to us. So we're gonna, and then we're gonna, um, in this, this benchmark, we'll then render that, that data into, a, uh, into the flex data grid component. Yeah? Do you trust that? Do I trust what? We do bounce checking on it before we actually throw it into memory. So, and there there is a bunch of things where you can't overwrite, you know, variables outside of the the scope of, of that. So, so it's um, it's been in Flash since I think Flash six or so, and we haven't seen any security problems with it so far. So, it's it's. Um, so I'll run this one. This one, same 5,000 rows. You'll see that 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 benchmark only took uh, under half a second there. So uh, same 5,000 rows, the, the parse time is nearly nothing because we don't have to do a whole lot because it's already in the object format that we, that we want within Flash. Then the render time, we're at only 63 milliseconds there. Yeah? OK, so you have a, some kind of integration into a Mozilla product called Tamarin. Yeah, yeah, Tamarin. It's going to go into Mozilla proper. Yeah, yeah, it will at some point. So the Mozilla guys are, are work working on integrating Tamarin into the, the Firefox uh, browser. Yeah. OK, and you, you talk about JITs, and you talk about binary, and you talk yeah. about performance. What does that actually mean? <laughs> I mean, you've been buzzing by us here with a, a zillion yeah. fancy sounding words. But <laughs> you know, I haven't heard, you know, what's the contribution yeah. here to, uh, to a Main Street product? I mean, you mean, to, where would I use Tamarin outside of outside of a browser or outside of Flash? No, I mean, what, this is, what will the contribution to mainstream Mozilla actually be? Um, the, the main contribution was for a virtual machine. So, so that, that virtual machine is specifically for running ECMAScript code or JavaScript 2 or our implementation is called ActionScript 3. But that virtual machine is just a virtual machine. It's, it's, um, you could use that on your own if you wanted to, if you had needs for a virtual machine. But most people rely on a browser or Flash or something else for their virtual machine. So, um, so I don't, I don't know if that answers your question, but. So then will part of the contribution be a virtual machine for running uh, you know, all the JavaScript in your browser faster in Mozilla? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, sorry, sorry I didn't make that more clear. So, so the virtual machine does execute um, ECMAScript, ECMAScript Revision 4, which is the new standard for JavaScript 2. So when the browsers want to implement JavaScript 2 within the browser, then they will use the Tamarin virtual machine to actually execute that code. So rather than doing the, uh, inter uh, rather than interpreting JavaScript in their current virtual machine or how, how they do interpretation, they'll actually use Tamarin to, to execute that, uh, that, that code. Okay, so that applies to all, that in Tamarin, then in the future in Mozilla, that'll apply to all JavaScript in the browser, which yep. Yep, sounds absolutely. great. Yep. And um, at some point, are you going to talk about what the uh, you know technology integration is going to be for Mozilla, you know, in the future or Tamarin today and potentially Mozilla? Um, the the roadmap that I've heard for getting Tamarin into Firefox is Firefox four timeframe. The, the reasons for that are, from what I've heard, are not technical. They are more that JavaScript 2, the language is different enough from the previous versions of JavaScript that it will, it will break, uh, that if we force JavaScript 2 on, on 
sites, it'll break some of them. And so they have to wait a while before they can transition people to JavaScript too. Um, this is something we could probably talk more in depth with, with Dion about uh, afterwards, because he, he probably has more information than I do. Um, but um, but that's, that's as far as I know about the, how the browsers are integrating Tamarin into the, into the browser. Um, currently, the Tamarin is in Flash 9 today, and it is in Apollo uh, today, and we use it for our, our code execution. Yeah. You have a data bandwidth graph there, but do you have memory uh, overhead? I, yeah, so I'm, I'm not, um, as far as I know, I'm not able to get memory usage in JavaScript, but I am able to get it within Flash. So, um, so the entire Flex application that, that we'll see in just a second, uh, its memory overhead is about 25 megabytes of, of client-side memory. Um, and then, of course, the bandwidth is, is here, too. They, the, um, it, one of the interesting things about AMF3, the protocol, is that it, why it's so much less bandwidth is that what we do in the binary encoding is if we see a, a property that is, that is repeated, we don't put that in the stream more than once. We just put a reference to that. So it's kind of like a, a somewhat of a gzip uh, algorithm, but it's, but it's based on property values uh, rather than on you know, looking through ones and zeros for repeated, uh, repeated strings. So, so that's why the, the bandwidth is much smaller, but that also does all, uh, improve client-side memory as well. So, um, so let me go back to the, the Flex application. Here's, the, here's our Flex data grid with all 5,000 rows. You'll see a lot of the strings in this particular data set are repeated. So that's why the bandwidth is so much different uh, between, between Flex and Ajax uh, in, this particular, uh, in this particular use case. But you know, definitely, depending on your use case, um, you may not see that, that same performance difference. Okay. Yeah? So suppose I have, uh, I have several tabs, and I, I'm running different flash applications. Yeah. Uh, so mem my memory footprint overhead is 225, and it's shared across different tabs. And um, no, it would not be shared. Yeah, every instance of Flash on a page is a different instance of the virtual machine. So if you pulled in that same 5,000 rows in, in five different tabs, it would be 25 megs times five. Oh, okay. That 25 megs, is it Flash runtime memory? It's, it's, flash, it's flash runtime plus... Um, it's the entire flash memory footprint for this application with the data grid. So it's the, it's the flash runtime, it's the data grid, it's all 5,000 rows of data. All that combined is 25 megs of, of RAM. Okay. Yeah. So um, one thing I want to show real quickly, which you can explore further on your own, is that uh, because of Tamarin and the fact that it's JIT compiled, uh, if I increase this now to 20,000 rows, um, one thing that we can do uh, because of the performance of the JIT compiler is I can sort all 20,000 rows entirely instantaneously on the client side. And that's something that if you try the dojo test, even with 500 rows on the dojo test, it takes, um, it takes I think, 10, 20 seconds or so to sort 500 rows. So, so obviously, the, uh, you know, we, we're using JIT compilers and Java and other languages because of these performance benefits. And, and that's what we're, we're showing here is the, the performance benefits of Tamarin. So, and then we'll also see here that, that we still only took uh, under a second to get that 20,000 rows uh, to, to parse that or, you know, shove it into memory and, uh, and then to render that, that into data grid as well. Um, and we'll also see that the bandwidth is significantly less as, uh, as well, still at only 345K for that, for that 20,000 rows. So um, that's, that's another reason why, um, why Flex and Flash and, and Apollo are interesting is the fact that, that right now we can take advantage of this Tamarin virtual machine with the JIT compiler. We don't have to wait until the browser adds Tamarin uh, to speed up JavaScript. We can uh, get this performance benefits now. So um, that's, there's, there's another example I want to show which if you guys are Java developers, you may be familiar with, um, with the, the napkin skin that someone did for Swing a long time ago. Uh, so one of our engineers did the same thing with Flex. So he was able to, uh, to take our, our out-of-the-box Flex components and with CSS styling uh, and with some, some custom programmatic skinning, he was able to, to replicate the paper, um, the napkin skin. So this is kind of cool. It has you know, all the typical um, things in here in the... The data grid, you know, still works the same way as usual, but we get, you know, all the the nice um, napkin-looking feeling stuff here. So, uh, fun little little application to to show uh, just exactly or what you can do with skinning and styling. So, um, 
Another application that I want to show is actually Google Finance. So Google Finance is, uh, of course, one of your applications. And I always demo this application because it shows a, a great way to combine Flash-based uh, technologies, Flex applications, and Ajax applications in the same, uh, into the same experience. So here we have a very seamless user experience where um, we can get, you know, we can go through the news on the right. This is all Ajax, HTML-based content. Uh, and we have the Flash-based chart on the left. We can scroll through it. We get nice vector graphics, uh, you know, animations and, and stuff that you, that you uh, get with Flash. Um, but then we can communicate back and forth between these two. So if a user selects something in the uh, Ajax HTML content on the right, we can send that event over to the, the Flex or Flash application here, and we can do that bidirectionally. So, uh, so we have a toolkit called the Flex Ajax Bridge that allows you to, to easily do this communication back and forth between Flex and Ajax. So, um, so it's not, uh, you know, we're not, with Flex, we're not saying replace everything with Flex. Um, Ajax and HTML definitely have great places where they work very, very well, and we don't want to, um, you know, tell you to, that you have to use Flex for those things, um, like HTML link, and um, text and you know the, all, these are things that HTML does very very well uh, flex of, and flash of course are very good at vector graphics and performance and real-time messaging and those types of things and so so we can combine the two technologies together into a seamless user experience yeah Flash, yeah. Flex That's still the case. Um, interestingly, oh yeah, re repeat the question. Sorry. Um, so the question was, how do you layer Ajax and uh, Flash or Flex technologies together onto the same page? And um, I believe that this works on on all the browsers. Um, I've tested it on Safari and IE and and Firefox. I haven't tried it on Opera, but you'll see that. This, this application, this benchmark application, is actually a Flex application that I built. Um, but the output over here, of course, can be Ajax output as well as Flex output. So, so I did have to um, make, make that all work. So if we run one of these tests, this is HTML layered on top of my, my Flex application that you see. It kind of surrounds this now. But you know, if we go back and run one of the Flex ones, that's doing the same technique, just overlaying uh, another Flex application on top of a Flex application. So, so it's working here. The, the technique that we're using, um, there's a Flex component called iframe that allows you to do this. But we're just, we're just putting an iframe over top of the, the Flex application to make this work. Um, and then you could still communicate back and forth via, uh, via the, the Flex Ajax bridge. Can you do a right click on uh, two On which one? Um, this one is is the the flex output. Let me switch back to a, a Ajax output, and we'll we'll see the. So this is your basic HTML output um, here, and then of course over here is is flex flex application. And if we close that, then we're back to Flash. We just hid that iframe. We actually moved it up to the corner, uh, up to a hidden area. I think that. Um, for some reason, the browser, in order to actually kind of execute code within an iframe, it has to be like at least one pixel by one pixel or something like that. So I just hide it up in the top left corner there uh, to make it work. It's kind of a hack. It took me uh, about two days to make that actually work in all the browsers. But, um, but as far as I know, it does, it does work pretty consistently. Um, if you do an iframe in the middle, can you do a back? Uh, can you do a back it, you know, through the, the through iframes? Yeah, yeah. Interestingly, yeah, you you could do that. You could navigate back and forward through the the, the navigation within your iframe. Uh, within Flex, we have a built-in history manager that that does do an iframe on the page to then hook into the back and forward buttons within uh, within um, your Flex application. So um, this may not be the the best example to to show here, but. Um, but Yahoo Maps has actually done a really good job at, at integrating this behavior into their application. So this is a Flex application. And um, if I get directions from San Francisco to San Jose, 
you'll see that it's changing the, the named anchor in my URL, um, but it's also hooking into those, uh, the, the back and forward um, buttons. So now I can go back and we, we restore the state back to um, the previous place without doing a page refresh. The, the bookmarks are all, uh, or the, the URLs are all bookmarkable and can recreate the, the, um, the right state within the application. So, um, so yeah, so, so you get that um, the back and forward kind of integration uh, out of the box within Flex. There's also, if you need really customized behavior for back and forward, there is a uh, open source toolkit called the um, called URL kit that makes it really, um, really robust way to integrate with back and forward within the browser and also manage the, the named anchors as well. So yeah. All right. So. Um, Let's see. So the, another application that I want to show is another Apollo application. This one is actually Google Maps. So we were, we're transitioning from Yahoo Maps to your guys' uh, Google Maps. What, what we did was we took Google Maps, and we're actually rendering Google Maps now within an Apollo application. So this application was launched from the start menu. Um, it could work offline if we cached, uh, if we cached everything locally in local files. Um, but uh, in this particular application, it's, it's just pulling in all the Google Maps stuff from live from Google. Uh, and we have also over top of, of this, uh, over Google Maps, we have a little flex component. So here we can drag this little flex component around. You'll see it's semi-transparent. Um, we can now take a contact and drag it onto the map to, to, get, you know, to get that, uh, that particular location, uh, navigate to that particular location. So this is all running you know, just, just as normal Google Maps would within the browser, but, uh, but within an Apollo application that could be, um, that could be a, uh, that could be downloaded and installed and launched from your start menu or your Mac doc or whatever. So, and some, some other people have started to do some interesting things uh, as well, porting some of the other Google applications. Um, someone started doing Gmail, so now you could launch G Gmail from an Apollo application. Um, and I won't go all into that, but, um, but there's some interesting things, again, that you could do there. You could, uh, within that, that application, you could actually intercept like uh, the, when it's getting mail um, sent over to the client, you can save that mail locally and uh, do all sorts of offline things as well uh, within Apollo. Uh, one, one application that is, um, is doing some of the offline stuff, which I won't show the offline portion today, uh, but the, is a Salesforce application that we built. So this application actually goes out to Salesforce. It loads all of your customer data onto your local machine and even loads uh, customer documents that you may have. So if you, if you have documents for a customer or, or uh, meeting information, it'll actually save all this locally. So then if I were to disconnect from the, the network, close this application and launch it again, then I would still have all that same, same information uh, synchronized locally. Actually, I have to tell it to specifically synchronize an account because we don't want to you know, synchronize all my accounts unless, um, unless the user specifies to do that. But, um, but this, is, so this is all completely working, all synchronizing locally. This is something that uh, Salesforce uh, and us have been working on. Um, and one of, the, one of the great use cases for Apollo is being able to take your, your CRM applications or, or your business applications, be able to work on them while you're on the plane or um, while you don't have internet access. So um, that's, all right, so I'm going to start writing some code um, to show you guys a little bit about the, the, how you build these Flex applications. So um, to kind of preface this, I'm using a tool that we charge for to build these. But everything that I'm building, you could use the free, uh, the free Flex SDK to build. So there's nothing special in this tool that, that you couldn't do with the free tool. Um, the reason why I use the, the tool in this demonstration is that uh, because of the code completion and, and um, and because of the, the uh, syntax checking, um, I'm less, uh, much less error prone. So, um, but usually, I should also state, uh, Linux is my primary OS. I usually just present on, on Vista because I can never be sure if I plug into the projector with Linux that it's actually going to work. But when I'm on Linux, I use Vim as my primary uh, IDE and use Ant to do my builds and, um, and those sorts of things. So, so all using the, the free SDK. So I'll create a new project, and um, I'm sorry that I, again, have to use uh, someone else's product. But we're going to create an application that 
pulls in some images from Flickr and renders those in a component um, that, that the quietlyscheming.com guy made he, uh, to model the iTunes um, album art flipper. So uh, I need to go include that, that, um, that, that component inside my library path. So I can just add it. There's a number of different ways we could include that. But I'm just going to add the display shelf here to my library path. Uh, and now we've got that component. We can, we can now build against, uh, we can now implement that component in our application. So I need to take out my layout real quick. And so now I'm just going to use the default layout. And I'm going to add a Flickr service, which I'll show you in a minute. This is going to talk to Flickr for us. And then I'm also going to add a display shelf. And so the display shelf component is a reusable component that the, that the quietlyscheming.com guy made. I'll set the data provider now, and I'm going to use a binding expression. So since Flex applications run on the client within, within the Flash virtual machine, what's going to happen is um, this display shelf is going to be watching this Flickr service for changes. And when it sees changes, it's going to automatically refresh uh, to, to display those changes. So we're going to bind to uh, f.photos. And so that will, that's our photos array that we'll get back from Flickr. And then I need to add an event handler for creation complete. So creation complete gets thrown when the application is fully initialized. And so when, when we get the creation complete event, we want to call our Flickr service and call the get photos by tag method. And then I'm going to specify orange as the tag that I'm going to search Flickr for. So that's all we need in this particular application. So I'll, I'll save that. And it's just compiled that application into the, the Swift bytecode that runs within the Flash player. And now we can go in and run this as a Flex application. And so now we start to get some images from Flickr um, displayed in this display shelf component. So the display shelf, sometimes I have to close my browser rather quickly if you know, anything obscene comes up, but it looks like we're, we're OK. I, I usually use orange because it's, it's a pretty safe term. I tried Flex once. That wasn't a good idea. <laughs> um, so I try to stick to orange. Ooh, that one's kind of obscene. Um, so anyways, this is the display shelf component that Eli built. You'll see that it has the live reflection going on, has the nice transitions as we move between these, uh, these photos. So that was only a couple lines of code to use, uh, use that display shelf component and then also talk to Flickr. Um, I want to show you uh, a little bit about this Flickr service. The, the Flickr service, how am I doing on time? Well, I'm, I forgot to ask. 20 minutes. 20 minutes. OK, great. So, um, so the, the Flickr service is an ActionScript class. So with Flex, we combine the declarative XML, uh, which we call MXML, with the procedural ActionScript language. And so this Flickr service is definitely more of a procedural uh, type class. And so we wrote this in ActionScript. But this just talks to Flickr for us. So you'll see that the syntax is a lot like Java. It's the, the new JavaScript 2 syntax or ActionScript 3, whatever you want to call it. Um, you'll see that we have our, our Flickr, cl uh, Flickr service class. We have a photos array collection that's set to bindable, meaning that we can use that in a binding expression like we did in our, in our display shelf as the data provider. Here's the binding expression there. And then we also have an HTTP service, which is going to go out and make an HTTP call. Because remember, these, these Flex applications are running client side. So in order to get something from the server, we have to go over HTTP or some binary socket. So we have our HTTP service. In our constructor of our Flickr service, we set the URL. We set an event listener um, to, so that when we, get a result, when we get a response back from Flickr, we call this handle result function. And then we just loop through the results and render the and set those items as uh, add them to our array. Um, then we also have our get photos by tag method, which just takes a, a string with tags, and then we create our um, request parameters that we our RESTful style request parameters that we want to send to Flickr, and then we um, do a SRV.send. So that's a real simple class to talk to Flickr. Um, and and uh, one of the things that, that I like to show is kind of the difference here between uh, MXML and ActionScript. So within, within Flex, everything is ultimately ActionScript. So MXML is just there is, is almost like a code generation language. 
So we take MXML, actually, and we convert it into ActionScript. So everything that you can do in MXML, you could also do in ActionScript. ActionScript is our low-level language, um, and we just, um, we just provide the declarative language because it's very easy to begin prototyping applications. XML is also very familiar to HTML developers. Um, so we provide that as, as one way that you can build, uh, begin building your applications. So you'll see that, that this, this um, block of the XML is actually doing what would be you know, just a single line of action script. I could say, um, I could actually add a script block here. And inside my script block, instead of defining my Flickr service here, I could, I could actually define it here. I could say um, var f, which is our ID, and that's a Flickr service. So you'll see that the typing in JavaScript 2 uses colons. Um, and then we create a new Flickr service. So we could, we could do it that way in the, the scripting code. Um, this block does, in, uh, when it's code generation, would look exactly like this. Um, I just, I, for this, the purposes of this demo, I didn't um, do it with these, the script block because it adds like five lines or four lines of code and that four lines you know, makes the demo not look quite as cool. So um, one other thing I want to show here is uh, the debugging feature. So we can also set a, a breakpoint. You'll see I've already set one here. Let's clear that, set it back. Um, can set a breakpoint now here so that, so that if you did need to debug this application and see what exactly Flickr was giving you as a response, um, I can now launch my application in debug mode. And in debug mode, it automatically, I got my response back from Flickr, and now I'm in my debugger within Eclipse. This is integrated into the Eclipse debugger. I can see my stack trace, come in and see variables, set expressions, you know, all the, all the typical debugging things. So, uh, so this, this kind of thing helps you, you be a lot more productive when you're, when you're building your, your applications. So, um, that's, that's kind of the development experience. I could keep writing code if, you, if I've completely um, confused you guys with that, uh, that sample. Uh, any questions before I move on? Want to see more code? Anything? Yeah? Can you try to uh, move your flex code that's kind of kind of browser to your follow? Your ah, good, yeah, good question. So, oh, yes. Uh, the question was, how, how could I take this application and turn it into an Apollo application? So that's a, a great thing to show. Um, so th we use the same exact uh, Flex uh, library, Flex compiler, the free Flex SDK, um, to build our Apollo application. So uh, again, you could do this all with, with all the free tools. I'll do it here um, just for simplicity. But I'm going to create an um, Apollo Flickr app. And I have to, again, add to my library path that display shelf component. And I haven't tried this ahead of time, so hopefully it all works. But um, I'm going to do, we could do a much better reusable model than this. But um, just for the sake of time, I'm going to just do the copy and paste reusability model. And so I'll just paste in this code into my Apollo application. So same exact code. I'll save that. And now let's run this as an Apollo application. Oops, I'm in the wrong one. Here we go. Run as an Apollo application. And now we've just launched that same exact application, which should be talking to Flickr and rendering images. No. Well, interesting. Um, yeah, I should have tried this one ahead of time. Um, so that should be working. Not sure why it's not. Maybe my internet has problems. All right, let's try it again. Oh, oh there we go. All right. I was worried there. So here we have the same exact application now running as an Apollo application. And so this, the way that I just ran that is not the way that your user would run that. So let me show you real quickly the, the experience now for turning this into an Apollo application and then uh, in, in some way that you could give it to your users. So um, again, this could all be done through an AMP build or, or however you want to do it. But I'm going to export this application as an AIR file. AIR is the Apollo installable, installable archive. So now we can take this Apollo application, package it into an AIR file, and Oop, that's um, not the name I want. 
let's call it flickr.air. So now I've just saved that into an air file. So the air file is what you would put on your, uh, on your website or email to somebody. And now when they get that air file, if they have Apollo installed, they can just double click it and we launch the Apollo, Apollo installer. So now we're going to say, um, do you really want to install this application? It's going to have access to do whatever it wants on your local system. Are you sure you're OK with that? Uh, I am OK with that. I don't want a shortcut on my desktop. Continue. And now I could run it now, but I want to show you launching it through the start menu. So I'm um, going to tell it not to launch it now. But now we go to our start menu. And uh, here we have our Apollo Flickr. We can launch that application um, right from, oh, and those images were cached. So it went really fast. Well, that was kind of obscene. <laughs> um, so that's, that's the experience now for creating Apollo applications. What we're doing in the, the next version of Apollo, uh, which will be out, the, the full release version of Apollo will be out sometime this year. Uh, but, but, um, but the version that's out now is, is an alpha version. The next kind of alpha or beta version will include the ability to offer your users the, uh, the Apollo Air file or the um, or in a MSI or a Mac, um, whatever the Mac uh, installer is. So if the user doesn't have Apollo installed, then they can just download one one file that will install Apollo, then install your application. Um, so and that's that's how we'll uh, we'll get uh, a lot of users, um, you know, installing Apollo. Uh, we have we have some a lot of uh, really interesting customers. I just found this one. Um, the website last night. Let's go see if I can find it again. Uh, eBay is doing some interesting things with Apollo. Um, Project San Dimas is the code name there. Um, they actually have a site somewhere. There we go. So uh, Project San Dimas, uh, you could sign up for the, for the, the beta uh, on the site. But this is a full eBay desktop application built with Apollo. So it does some really interesting things. When you're offline, you can still you know, see items that, that were cached. You can, um, you, can, you can even post items while you're offline. And then when you reconnect, it will automatically submit your, your items that you've, um, that you've created uh, to, to eBay. So there's some really cool things uh, in this application. Um, and we should be seeing public betas of this in the next month or so. Yeah? Um, the Apollo currently runs on Mac and Windows, and they're working on the Linux version, which um, should be out sometime after the 1.0 version, they've said. So, um, so as long as it's Windows or Mac, you, you'll be fine. Um, Linux will be sometime in the future. So could I eventually run on a Linux running on ARM processor? Uh, I believe so, yeah. Oh, the, the question was, could I run this on Linux running ARM? And um, I believe the answer is yes. Um, one of the reasons why uh, I think ARM is, you're, you're talking more about like mobile devices. Uh, one of the reasons, I'll give you a little uh, secret information about Apollo. One of the reasons why we chose WebKit as our HTML rendering uh, as opposed uh, to, to Gecko was that, that WebKit is much more suited for mobile devices because Nokia has been investing a lot in WebKit. So that may give you some indication as to where we're going with Apollo. So that's um, so. I, I would hope that the answer to your question would be yes. Uh, I don't know what time frames are. Yeah. Uh, will Apollo be world-class desktop citizen? That uh, can you obviously like copy and paste between other applications? Like if I right. need Word and then right. a copy text over to Apollo application, will Word copy and paste the other way? Yeah. Yeah. So the question is, how, how integrated can Apollo applications be with the desktop? So for 1.0, the, the things that you can do are you can, you can read and write files to the local file system anywhere. You're not in a file system sandbox. You can catch online, offline events. You can do uh, system tray notifications. You can do background processes. You can do copy and paste um, with native applications. You can do drag and drop um, with the native OS. Um, and I'm probably forgetting a few things. But, but the, the main thing that you won't be able to do in 1.0 uh, is talk to uh, local DLLs. Um, and the, the, there's a lot of people that really want that, the ability to talk to DLLs. Um, but they're, we're trying to figure out the best way to do that because we don't want to break cro the cross-platformness of Apollo. We want to, to maintain cross-platform. You're not going to rewrite Acrobat with Apollo? 
Uh, at some point, we might. Yeah, I don't, uh, we, we have quite a few internal projects using Apollo currently. Uh, the, we announced uh, just a couple weeks ago the Apollo or the Adobe Media Player. That is an Apollo application. Uh, and there's a number of other uh, internal Adobe projects right now going on that are using Apollo. Yeah, yeah, question in the back. Was that? DRM in Apollo. Uh, not at this time. Um, some people have asked for it. Some people have asked that we never add it. And I'm not sure what the current status of that is. The Adobe Media Player uh, definitely has some kind of DRM, uh, but it's not anything that was built into the Apollo runtime itself. So they implemented it on top of uh, Apollo. Yeah. What about 3D? What was that? What about 3D? There was a project called Atmosphere. Atmosphere. Um, we used to have a project called Central. Central was kind of the, the predecessor of Apollo. It was a desktop runtime for Flash applications. Um, but now with Apollo, we're not just about Flash applications. We're about AJAX, um, HTML, JavaScript, and, uh, and Flex and Flash applications. So. Is this 3D? Oh, 3D. I'm sorry, I mis misheard you. Um, 3D is not something that is currently supported. Uh, it's something that they're looking at adding for future versions of both Flash and Apollo. Um, but, but at this point, um, if you want to do 3D, actually, uh, today within our, our interestingly, the, that Tamron virtual machine is fast enough that um, some people have done some really interesting things. Uh, there's this project called Paper Vision 3D that's an open source project that does 3D within, I don't know if this is the right one. Yeah, it looks like it might be. Um, so they've, they've created a 3D engine uh, or 3D-like engine on top of the current Flash 9 virtual machine. And we'll see if we can find a little demo here. Here we go. So this is running within, within Flash 9. We have, uh, I don't, I'm not a real 3D guru, so I don't know everything that's going on here. But, but this is just uh, able to happen through the performance of, of Tamarin uh, within Flash 9. So, and this is an open source 3D library. Uh, I've never used it, so I don't know all the details. But supposedly, it's pretty interesting. Other questions? Yeah. So. Uh you mentioned that uh, most of Apollo applications in the example you said, you said it, you know, it gives you full access to the disk. Does Apollo support any sort of uh, sandboxing? Uh, we're, I don't know what the total story will be for 1.0. I don't even know if we're sure yet what the story will be for 1.0. We're definitely working on a signing model, so you'll be able to sign your Apollo applications. And I don't know exactly how we're going to implement that as far as different sandboxes for signed applications or not. Um, I, I, I don't know if we even know yet what we're going to do there, because it's a pretty complex problem. Um, it's, uh, we found that, um, that once a user, I think somebody was telling me we did these user studies, where as soon as the user clicks the, the button to like download or run an Apollo application, it doesn't matter what dialog box we put in front of them. Even if it's like a gigantic like hazard sign saying, like, this thing will destroy your computer, People completely ignore it, and if they want to install it, they will. And so, so we're trying to figure out, all right, what does this mean to creating a security model that actually works? And um, you know, even like this has been one of the problems with Java and signed signed applications is that if a user wants to install something, if they think that it's something that they want to install, they don't care what the dialog box tells them about what what this application could do to their computer. So we're trying to figure out exactly what the what the best security model there is. What sort of language level protections are there to keep programs from escaping the sandbox? And what sort of uh, assurance do you, like, what sort of QA do you do to make sure that the sandbox can't be breached? Um, that's a good question. So, what kind of assurances do we make that that the that the applica Apollo applications can't escape the sandbox? And I don't have a whole lot of information about that, but uh, I think the the best answer to that is that if you look at Flash's history of of how well its sandbox has been, and, and that I don't know if there's been an occurrence of anyone breaking out of the Flash sandbox um, within the browser, uh, that we're putting the same kind of scrutiny on Apollo to make sure that, that it's just as secure and, and uh, as the Flash player has been. So, so that's, I'm sorry I don't have more technical details for you, but 
but I would, I would hope that you know, we have the same team working on doing the security uh, testing against Apollo that do the Flash player. So, so we should be you know, similar, similar uh, situations. Other questions? Yeah. Without, oh, good question. So I didn't really go into the typing. So, so the, the JavaScript 2, ActionScript 3, ECMAScript 262, Revision 4, that language allows you to do optional static typing. So you can type your objects if you want to. You don't have to. That's something that I could actually show real quickly uh, here is in our ActionScript code for our Flickr service, um, I can take a type off. We'll take this type off, and things will compile just fine, but I'll get an additional compiler warning, which I could disable if I wanted to, telling me that, that hey, um, this isn't typed. You, maybe you should look at typing it. But yeah, you can, you can, do, you can mix and match uh, typing uh, as you want to. Yep. Uh, one more question, and then I'm out of time. You mentioned yeah. IMF3 stuff. How do I generate that? Is that part of what? AMF3? Yeah. Yeah, so um, AMF is, uh, is a protocol that's documented on osflash.org. There are, there are numerous open source and free implementations of it. Uh, one for Java is called Granite Data Services. There's also a Open AMF. There's AMF PHP um, and Red5 and lots and lots of implementations out there. We have a commercial product that if you really want to purchase, you can. Um, but there's, there are open source implementations out there. So, yeah, good question. Thank you. All right, well, I think I'm out of time. Thank you all for coming. Hope you learned something.